Thank you. I hesitate to begin because it's so hard to find a room full of people talking about politics that look so happy these days. That's because they're Democrats. That's right. It is, it is good to be around a, a friendly audience. Um, earlier I was speaking with someone today and um, she said that her friends often tell her, you know, you are so nice and sweet and you're kind to everybody, but you're liberal. And, and I, of course, want to point out that that's because we are liberal. That actually works for what we When I first announced my candidacy, a lot of people talked to me about the topic we're discussing tonight, abortion. And many people told me, Josh, you should avoid this topic. You should, if you are ever asked about this topic, you should pivot to something much friendlier to you in this district. And maybe I'm just old-fashioned, or maybe um, I'm not a politician quite yet, but I actually like to tell people what I think about things. I like to tell you clearly what I propose, and I want to give you my thoughts on why I'm proposing those things. And that's a pretty radical idea. It has been 427 days since my opponent, Representative Collins, has given a town hall. Not that anybody's counting. <laughs> and it is my commitment to come face to face with my constituents. And I hope that there are people in the room tonight who believe that they are pro-life. And I hope that there are people in the room tonight who would identify as pro-choice. Because by the time we finish tonight, I want us to all realize that we are in this together and that we can do a lot more actual change about this topic together than we can if we remain divided. Really, that's a great place to start. After the Kavanaugh hearings this past week, many politicians and commentators were alarmed at just how divided our nation is. I found that a little misleading because most of the people I talk to on both sides of the aisle are fairly united about a lot of things. They're worried about the corruption that plagues our government. They're concerned about the environment. They're afraid of how they're going to afford health care and education. And they're afraid of finding a good job for themselves or their children. We are very united about those concerns. And the very people who are worried about how divided we are have spent their careers dividing us. N neighbors are turning against neighbors. Yeah. Children are turning against parents. Na uh, communities are being torn apart. There are people who can't go to Thanksgiving dinners, book clubs, or even churches anymore because of the divisions and the passions in our society. So I wanted to start today by speaking about this topic where there is no other topic that is more divisive that is more prone to induce passion and anger sometimes and fear than abortion. I've had a lot of conversations about this, and in fact, I've spent a lifetime dealing with this issue. When I was younger, I went to a very conservative evangelical church. And when I was a young man, I was firmly convinced that I was pro-life. And what that meant for me when I was young was that we should ban abortions. I went to college. I had some time to reflect on these issues, and I spoke with people with different perspectives. And for a while there, I thought I was pro-choice. I thought I had changed my mind, that I was now pro-choice. But after further reflection, and after extensive research and contemplation and prayer on this topic, I believe that I am now pro-life because I am pro-choice. The life of the unborn, which is something that we hear an awful lot about in this country, we are told in Georgia that we are pro-life. Georgia is dead last in the United States of America in maternal mortality rates. We have more women die for, from getting childbirth than Sri Lanka. But we're told, of course, that we're a pro-life state. We're told we're a pro-life state, even though in 2016, 
we were number one in the nation, not for education, not for health care outcomes, not for being insured, but for the number of toddlers who died because they had access to handguns and guns lying around the house. I keep hearing politicians and organizations call themselves pro-life while supporting taking children from their parents at the border, traumatizing those young lives for the rest of their days on this earth. People here often tell me they're pro-life and yet they support a law and order system that does not value the life of people of color. I've come to the conclusion that maybe I'm just a little bit more pro-life than other politicians. I'm so pro-life I actually believe in life after birth. <laughs> I am so pro-life that I actually admit and confess that I believe women are also alive. And in our form of government, all the way from our Declaration of Independence, life has always been intertwined with liberty. We are endowed by our Creator, our founding document says, with inalienable rights to pursue life and liberty. And if we deprive someone of their liberty, we are depriving them to some extent of their fullest life. Speaking of the unborn, speaking of division. I so often hear this topic discussed as though the woman doesn't exist. We must protect the life of the unborn. As though the unborn fetus or baby or child or whatever you want to call it is separate from the very being that is nurturing that new life. You cannot be pro-life unless you are in favor of full life and liberty for the living human being who has that new life in her possession as part of her body. And I want to tell you why this is actually pro-life. It may surprise some people to hear this. But the nation with the very lowest abortion rate in the entire world is a nation which has almost no restrictions on abortion. Switzerland. The reason that they have low abortion rates is because contraception is widely available. Because poverty is much more rare than it is in this country. And even though women have full access to abortion services, the abortion rate is lower than it is in Texas. I'm afraid that there are a lot of very good people in this district and in this nation who consider themselves pro-life, but they've only been ever given one choice of how to be pro-life. If you are pro-life, you must be in favor of banning abortions. I believe that not only is that not pro-life, I believe that it's deadly for women. We must not believe or pretend that banning abortions would save a single life. We know from the statistics the way to reduce abortions is to actually nurture the full life, not only of the unborn, but of the living human being whose body houses and nurtures that unborn. So if we do not begin by respecting the life of women, we cannot have a truly pro-life conversation. Women who are poor are twice as likely to have an abortion as women who are not. And I believe that we will not become a truly pro-choice society or a pro-life society until we realize that making sure poverty comes to an end in this country will save not only the unborn, but the life and the health and the wellness, the pursuit of liberty for poor women. Let's fight poverty. That's the way to reduce abortions. I'm afraid that the people who mean well, who vote for so-called pro-life candidates, that they are in danger 
of doing a grave injury and injustice in the name of doing something good. Because when you deprive a woman of her constitutional right over her own body and the privacy of her own womb, you are committing a grave evil. Not only is it ineffective, it is immoral. And the good people that I know who are against abortion want to do the right thing. Let's discuss tonight how to do the right thing. How can we address a culture of life in this country and embrace all life? Pass the slogan. 